Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the Power Up NYC Community Town Hall tonight. We're just going to give folks a few more minutes to join and we'll get started around 6.05. Okay, well, it seems like the trickle has slowed, so I'm happy to kick us off. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia Vijad Lehman. I'm an energy policy advisor at the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, and thanks so much for joining us on this rainy evening to talk about the city's energy transition. Uh, we had a lot of fun at the in person community town hall last Thursday. So thanks to those of you that were able to make it. I see some familiar names. Um, but we're really excited to dig in on the uh, more technical side of things this evening. So I'll kick us off with a brief overview of New York City's energy goals and how the Power Up initiative fits into that, and then pass it over to our consultant team at E3 to get into the specifics of the research topic that we're going to be talking about today um, relating to greening the grid. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, I'll just talk briefly about our energy goals. So I... Um, of course, feel very fortunate to work for the city of New York, where I was born and raised. New York City is taking the climate crisis seriously. We have a goal to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, which includes 100% clean electricity by 2040. Um, and we're really focused on making sure that the transition is equitable, one that prioritizes clean air and healthier environments for frontline communities, um, and also one that enables broader participation in energy planning, which is part of the reason that we're here today. Um, we want to make sure that our energy system is uh, more affordable as we transition. Right now, we have about a million and a half residents who are energy cost burdened, which means that they pay too large of a percentage of their income on energy bills. Um, so there's an exciting opportunity in this transition to change that and make costs more affordable for residents and direct savings towards those who need it most. 
Um, so we're focused on, on that and doing that while maintaining a reliable and resilient energy system, even as we're bringing more solar and wind onto the grid and as climate impacts are continuing to intensify. Um, so we've got our work cut out for us. Um, on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about our office. So we are now the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. You may have heard of us in our previous iterations, which were the Offices of Sustainability and the Office of Resiliency. We're now combined into one office that thinks more holistically about climate mit mitigation and adaptation through a justice lens. Um, so society has a long history of pushing a disproportionate share of environmental burdens onto communities um, with low income residents, with communities of color, often communities that have the least amount of political power and the least contribution to environmental degradation. So environmental justice really works to address that by ensuring access and inclusion for people throughout the planning process and really closing the gap on some of the exposures to environmental and health hazards like air pollution um, and water pollution. Uh, climate justice kind of extends that to recognize that these same historically overburdened communities are the ones that are also most vulnerable to a rapidly changing climate um, because climate change tends to exacerbate a lot of socioeconomic and health inequities. So, so we're really um, focused on, on prioritizing frontline communities in this transition. So what does the energy transition entail? On the next slide, I'll show some pillars of the energy transition that are pretty widely agreed upon. Um, first, we need to reduce demand. So the less energy that you use, the, the less new clean energy that you need to build and pay for. So that can range from something as simple as installing high efficiency light bulbs, like the ones shown here. Uh, this is Green City Force handing these out in the Bronx. Um, or it could be a more complicated weatherization process, like upgrading to more efficient windows or improving insulation, things like that. Um, then once we've re reduced demand, we need to switch to electricity wherever feasible. Um, so that could be heating your building with electric heat pumps instead of natural gas boilers um, or switching to electric buses instead of diesel ones like the one shown here on 42nd Street. And then finally, we need to make sure that all that new electricity that we're using is clean. So the state mandates 70% clean by 2030 and 100% clean by 2040. Um, so I'll just pause for a second to note the enormity of this task. Um, the electricity industry has not really changed significantly since its inception over 100 years ago, and now we're really needing to transform it at lightning speed. Um, so things are moving, and it's an exciting time to really think about how we can put the muscle behind the transition so that the system that unfolds is one that's more equitable than it has been to date and one that um, can meet our justice mandates. So where does Power Up fit in? On the next slide, um, Power Up is basically an inclusive planning process for the energy transition, um, part based on engagement and part based on research. So first is understanding and uh, you know fighting for New York City's New Yorkers' priorities when it comes to an energy transition. So for this project, we've partnered with five exceptional CBOs throughout the five boroughs shown here and received their feedback, as well as leaned on their expertise and community trust and on the ground networks to engage more New Yorkers in this important conversation. Um, and then the second piece of this process, which we'll really be focused on today, is the research. So there's been a lot of analysis done already by both the city and the state to understand what needs to be done for the energy transition. And we really don't want to be reinventing the wheel or doing modeling that just confirms what we already know. We're really aiming to build off of um, what's already been established and then develop deep dive research topics that fill in uh, gaps that we know exist and sort of stand in the way of creating concrete, uh, actionable strategies that we can move forward. So you'll hear more about the research that fills in those gaps tonight. And then where we're headed, um, we're publishing a report. Uh, the goal is to get it out by April of 2023 that will outline specific strategies city government can take in the near term to advance an equitable energy transition. Um, this is the first but not the last of these energy plans were required by local law to publish an energy plan every four years, um, which is a good thing because this is going to take a lot of iteration. Um, what's needed today is going to be different than what's needed eight or 12 years from now. Um, so we're in it for the long haul and hope you guys are too. Um, so today we're going to talk about the research questions that are specifically related to greening the grid. Um, tomorrow we have another session focused on electrification of buildings and vehicles. Um, I'll just note before I pass it over is that you guys should feel free to add your questions into the chat at any time. We want this to be interactive, so we're happy to answer questions as we go. 
Um, and with that, I'm happy to introduce Zach Satilli, who's the lead consultant on this project at the firm Energy and Environmental Economics, or E3, um, to kick off our discussion on the research. Thanks, Claudia, and good evening. So tonight, as Claudia mentioned, we'll be talking about three topics. The first will be energy storage, the second will be public lands, and the third will be in-city wind. So we'll present each, and then there'll be time for Q&A after each as well. We'll pause and take questions. To keep this orderly, what we'd suggest is if you have a comment during our presentation, please put that comment into the chat. And then at the end of each presentation, we'll take the comments in order. And then uh, with there's available time, we'll, we'll call on anybody with raised hands. And with that said, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Kevin Steinberger, to discuss our energy storage research. Kevin, let me see if I can get you off mute. Looks like you may be stuck. There we go. I think I was uh, stuck on mute. Can you hear me okay now, Zach? Great. Thanks so much. And thanks, Claudia and Zach, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Kevin Steinberger. I'm based at E3's New York office. Um, and I'm excited to be leading this energy storage research topic and to be discussing that with you all tonight. So first, as uh, context, our overall goal with this research topic is to assess opportunities for energy storage to facilitate the replacement of in-city fossil fuel power generation. And I'll start by providing more context around what energy storage is and the role that it can play in reducing New York City's reliance on fossil fuels in the electricity sector. Energy storage systems are large batteries that are fundamentally the same chemistry and technology as the batteries in our phones or computers, and also the same batteries that are being used in most electric vehicles today. So large scale or grid scale energy storage systems can play an important role in our electricity system by charging and storing energy during times of high renewable energy output, like a really sunny afternoon, and then discharging or providing power during times of highest demand, like when everyone gets home and turns on their air conditioners during a hot summer day. Historically, power plants that run on fossil fuels have played that role of ramping up during times of peak electricity demand, and as a result are often referred to as peaking power plants or simply peakers. And the goal of this research topic is to focus on how installing new energy storage systems can reduce the city's reliance on all fossil plants with a focus on these peaker power plants, which often represent the uh, easiest candidates for replacement with battery storage given their uh, limited run times and many of which are already very old and have some of the highest pollution rates of the city's generation fleet. And several of these plants are also located in disadvantaged communities. And so removing those plants from the system would also uh, deliver benefits to these communities. On the next slide, we've split this research area into more targeted and more specific questions including an examination of how the impacts of the planned new clean energy resources and new transmission lines that are being built on the electricity system will impact the operations of the fossil generation plants in New York City. How installing new and additional battery storage can enable uh, the replacement or reduction of uh, fossil fuel generation in the city and what factors the city should consider to support the deployment of battery storage with a focus on how those deployments of new storage resources can also provide the greatest benefits to disadvantaged communities. On the next slide, uh, we've provided some detail on how we're examining the operations of the New York electricity system. Um, and so to to study those questions, we've developed a modeling simulation that takes into account the expected changes on the New York electricity system between today and 2030. Um, and so that 
we can kind of think about that in on both the supply and demand side of the equation. So starting with demand, we know that electricity demand is going to increase between now and 2030 um, because we're working on electrifying building heating demand um, and also trying to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles, both of which will contribute to increases in total electricity consumption. And we can see that in terms of how the total stack is increasing in this chart on the right um, between 2021 and 2030. When we focus on the supply side of the equation, uh, we know that uh, the contributions of renewable electricity will increase um, because you know, we're in the process of procuring new resources to meet the state's 70% uh, renewable electricity goal by 2030, which is set into law by the, the New York State Climate Act. Um, and so we can see uh, in this chart on the right, the significant expansion of renewable resources um, including onshore and offshore wind in the shades of, of light blue, um, as well as increases in both large scale solar projects and behind the meter customer solar projects in the different shades of gold at the top there. Um, and so as a result of those expansions in uh, the, the electricity that we're receiving from renewables, even as demand is increasing, uh, our modeling projects that generation from fossil-based resources will decline significantly by over 60% between now and 2030 uh, across New York State. Our analysis also allows us to zoom in on New York City specifically. Um, so when we zoom in uh, from the statewide level to New York City, uh, if we advance to the next slide, um, we find that the increases in clean energy across the state also contribute to significant reductions in uh, fossil generation in New York City. Um, and the generation from uh, fossil fuel power plants in New York City declines by more than 40%. Um, so while that's less than uh, the decline statewide uh, due to you know, continued constraints on delivering power uh, from upstate uh, New York into the city, as well as certain constraints on delivering power within um, certain areas of the city. The declines in fossil generation in New York City are a really significant achievement driven by the additional clean energy over the, that's expected to be built over the next several years. Um, and we're well on our way to contracting and, and building many of those resources. The other thing that I think is important about this chart is that we've broken out the contributions of fossil generation in New York City by technology type. Um, so the, the light gray at the bottom of this chart uh, refer to combined cycle power plants, which are often some of the most efficient power plants um, in the city and, and have low, relatively low rates of pollution per uh, unit of generation. Um, then in the middle uh, shade of gray, combustion turbine plants are often a little bit newer um, and you know, while less efficient than combined cycle units, um, some of these have um, lower rates of pollution than the last category here, which is steam turbine units. Um, and steam turbine units, many of these plants um, are plants that were built uh, in the 60s, some of which were even built as early as the 50s. Um, and so these are some of the oldest, often some of the oldest power plants in the city and often also have some of the highest rates of pollution um, per unit of, of generation. And so notably the largest declines in output across these generation technologies occur in these steam turbine power plants. Um, and so um, that means that there may be uh, significant opportunities to um, replace the operations of these units uh, with battery storage. If we advance to the next slide, um, this slide is, uh, and this, this map on the right, is another way of sharing the same information from the analysis that's been shown on the previous two slides um, through a different lens. Um, and so what we're focused on here is the percent of the year that power plants are operating in 2030. 
Um, and if we focus on the plants in the, in the city in this lightest shade of blue, um, these are plants that are operating for less than 1% of the year. Um, and so this brings us back to the role of energy storage and the capabilities of those technologies. Um, energy storage technologies today are often technologies that can store and uh, discharge energy for four hours at a time or sometimes up to eight hours at a time. Um, and so for storage to be able to replace uh, fossil power plants, um, it's important that uh, the plants are not running very frequently. What we find in our analysis is that many plants across the city um, are running uh, infrequently at, at rates, um, at utilization rates of less than 1% of the year. Um, and so when we look at the operations of these units, we, we often find that the capabilities of energy storage are well suited to mimic the operations of these fossil power plants and provide the same capabilities and services to the grid that these plants are providing. And so uh, you know, that's really important because we all want uh, the electricity system to be uh, you know, just as reliable or even more reliable as it is today and provide the same services um, that it is today. So we wanna uh, you know, make this energy transition while maintaining reliability or you know, keeping the lights on for, for all customers. And so what's going to be really critical to achieve that is to ensure that the city is well positioned to um, site and build energy storage that can, uh, again, provide many of the same capabilities as these fossil plants um, and enable the replacement of these units and removal of these units from the system to deliver concrete uh, health benefits to our communities by reducing their pollution. Um, I'm noticing a question in the in the chat, and we've covered a lot of ground already. So I'll pause for a minute before turning to the remainder of our analysis. Um, so you know, this is a question around a you know, disruptions to the grid and backup energy. Um, and you know, one of the things that you know, we think it, again is critical is that. Um, you know, as we're making this clean energy transition, the system is just as or more reliable and resilient as, as it is today to these types of disruptions. Um, I think in terms of tackling uh, resilience to, um, to blackouts is gonna depend on, on the specific conditions, but we do think that um, you know, in some cases, having distributed storage across the city um, can play a role in meeting you know, what Con Ed is, is calling um, resilience hubs and, and trying to make sure that um, you know, we're increasing the resilience of the grid because we know that you know, climate change is going to intensify storms and lead to um, you know, increasing challenges on the grid. And we want to, again, make sure that we're ensuring the same or higher quality of, of service and reliability and resiliency as we are today. So uh, in this research topic, we're, we're also focused on uh, how we can site and build energy storage in New York City. Um, again, in order to be able to remove these, these fossil units from the system, um, we need to you know, identify key siting considerations for storage and make New York City an attractive and viable place for um, project developers to build new battery storage projects. Um, so you know, we know that there's a lot of competition for, for space in New York City um, and, and land is expensive. And, and what we're working on in this research topic is uh, developing a framework that can help prioritize opportunities where uh, you know, there's vacant land and there you know, may not be competing uses and, and where there are good opportunities to um, build battery storage given its importance in the clean energy transition. And so what we're showing on this map on the right is you know, the, starting with the same layer of where power plants are across the city, 
um, and you know, their associated runtimes. And then layering on uh, vacant land that's um, you know, managed by the city um, in, in red here. And uh, in the in gray or teal um, substations, which represent you know, grid infrastructure where um, you know, ideally we would site storage near so that it can um, connect to the grid and, and provide um, those, um, those same services that, that power plants today are currently providing. Um, and you know, as we move forward with this research topic, we are looking at, you know, at a whole host of different siting considerations in addition to the ones shown on this map. Um, so the size of the lot is of course important and how much storage you can provide um, or build on, on the lot and um, you know, whether it, um, the economics pencil out um, given the, the size of the lot, as well as, um, you know, where uh, in different uh, zones across the city, um, where storage can be, can be permitted, you know, whether that's a commercial zone or a manufacturing zone, um, given various safety restrictions, depending on uh, the size of the project. Um, and of course, you know, we want to take into account potential competing uses and, and community consideration to make sure that um, storage is being built um, in an equitable way. If we move to the next slide, um, we provided uh, a little bit more detail on how we're, we're breaking out um, battery storage by different use cases. Um, so, um, the first column here is showing um, large scale or you know, grid scale, utility scale uh, projects. These are projects that are um, larger than than five megawatts, um, and you know often need to be on either um, you know repurposed uh, land, like um, land that was previously used for large manufacturing facilities, or other vacant lots, um, and often need to be you know in the range of um, 7,000 square feet or higher. So that kind of narrows the pool of potential opportunities um, and storage projects at this size um, would likely need to be cited either in manufacturing zones or um, certain commercial zones. We also are considering um, projects that are eligible for the value stack, which is a tariff that um, the state defined um, and a compensation mechanism that, that storage projects would be eligible for. Um, and those projects are slightly smaller than the prior category, but still fairly large. Um, and so those projects are you know, between 1,000 and 2,000 square feet. And again, you know, could be cited in manufacturing zones as well as you know, a, a broader subset of, of commercial zones across the city. Um, and then lastly, you know, distribution scale and building integrated projects are you know, by definition much smaller and more scalable across the city. And in our implementation recommendations, we'll identify steps that the city can potentially take to facilitate their deployment. Um, but for the purpose of thinking about this analytically and where potential projects can be cited, um, we're really focused on these, these larger two categories and, and trying to identify the, the size of the, the potential um, opportunity set uh, across tax lots across the city. Um, and so if we move to the next slide, just I'll just um, briefly uh, speak to this and now we're getting a little deeper into the into the weeds here. Um, but you know tying this back to how we're thinking about this from the perspective of our analytical framework, um, yeah, this is a preliminary analysis and, and is probably over inclusive relative to um, where we'll land once we apply all the different citing considerations we've been discussing. But you know, what we're working on is using publicly available information about tax lots across the city. Um, we're able to apply those different categories of uh, market use cases for storage and apply our screening criteria around you know, projects of different sizes, being in different zones based on um, permitting and, and safety considerations. Um, and we're able to then you know, 
use all that information and the, the tax lot database to identify the total available potential to build storage across the city um, by you know, layering on those, those different geospatial considerations. Um, and so we're in the process of examining you know, where those opportunities exist, um, applying you know, additional considerations such as um, you know, proximity to transmission infrastructure, um, overlap with um, you know, environmental justice areas and, and varying com community considerations, and think about how we can develop a framework that identifies these opportunities, um, makes it easy for developers to site and build storage where there are opportunities that um, align with all of those, those different considerations and objectives. Um, and, you know, as we move forward, you know, in this energy transition, uh, accelerate the build out of storage in a way that can drive the replacement and uh, of fossil units and reduce the city's reliance on um, fossil fuel power plants um, over the coming years. So um, I'll pause there and see, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but um, please enter any questions you all may have um, and uh, happy to address those as best we can. Not seeing any questions in the chat or any hands up. Um, someone can correct me if that's not the case. Um, also saying, yeah, if folks want to just unmute and ask questions, that that works too. We'll give it another minute or so before we I turn it over to my colleague Sam for the next research area. Okay, I see a question around why um, steam turbines are um, are you know, maybe the best candidates for replacement. Um, so many of the the steam turbines um, in in New York City were built um, in the in the sixties, some even in the fifties, um, and so these are uh, fairly inefficient units. Um, and often have higher rates of, of air pollution uh, per unit of generation. Um, so even though they're not necessarily running very much, they often contribute a, a disproportionate share of the air pollution that's harmful to, to folks' health. Um, and you know, that, in addition to their age, um, I think makes them some of the, the strongest candidates for potential replacement with, with battery storage. Um, the next question is, are there any safety concerns regarding uh, the battery technology? Um, and that's something that uh, the, the fire department has been actively working on. And so they developed a set of regulations around how um, the, the storage project needs to be configured to ensure that um, it's, um, it's safe and that there are steps that are taken to, you know, both prevent fires and to, to um, you know, address those if, if an accident does occur. Um, Claudia, feel free to jump in if there's more you want to add around all the work that I know is being, being done on that front. Sure. So we are uh, very supportive of energy storage because we know it's critical to meeting our clean energy goals. But that being said, the city is very focused on ensuring that any energy storage that is built in the five boroughs is done so in a safe way. So the fire department and the Department of Buildings have a lot of regulatory processes by which the developer and the manufacturers of the batteries have to go through strict fire safety testing and design the battery to be um, to meet the most strict rules <laughs> Uh, in terms of design and installation. So our 
job now as a city is to figure out how can we streamline those permitting and regulatory processes so that they're not so strict so as to not allow any energy storage to be built in the city, but to make sure that we're not sacrificing any uh, safety considerations as we um, open up the doors for energy storage to be built in the five boroughs. Um, I also see a question about rooftop residential batteries. I know that there is a a proposal in Williamsburg that's currently under review by the Board of Standard and Appeals for putting a, a battery on the roof of a building. Um, that has also undergone strict review by both Department of Buildings and the Fire Department. So um, I don't believe that has completed, but if it were to get through both of those regulatory processes, then I think we could be fairly confident that uh, the battery is safe since those processes are quite strict. Um, but that being said, um, I know that there have been instances of accidents around the world, particularly in, in New York City recently with e-bikes, which are sort of a different regulatory framework um, and don't have as strict regulation as the stationary energy storage batteries. So all of this to say that safety is absolutely a top priority when it comes to building out energy storage um, in the city, but we do also know that it is critical to meeting our clean energy goals. So I don't think it's one or the other. I think we can have both. Thanks everyone. Um, not seeing any other questions in the chat, so I'll um, uh, just just at the wire. I'll, I'll address this last question and then turn it over. Um, so, how long are are renewables expected to to last? Um, I think that's a question around the lifetime of of the plants. Um, you know, Many of these, um, it's, it's a little bit different for uh, you know wind and solar than it than it is for battery storage actually. So you know, solar and wind projects I think are generally um, expected to last you know at least twenty or thirty years and um, and often longer. Um, battery storage projects because of the way they're operated, um, you know likely need to be either you know, augmented on kind of an annual or, or biannual basis and, and kind of upgraded throughout, um, which just requires you know, a little bit of expense each year or um, you know, replaced every you know, around 10 years. And so um, a lot of that is already kind of built into the economic picture that developers are considering and um, and you know, factoring that into the project economics to, to make sure that those projects are viable, not just at the installation date, but throughout the you know, 20 or 30 year lifetime that they're expecting to be um, available on the electricity system. I think we're now just about at time, so I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sam Lang, to speak about our public land research area. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam, and today I'm going to be talking about the public land research topic within PowerUp. Um, so just for a little bit of kind of context before I dive into the research, um, so currently the city has a goal of installing 100 megawatts of solar capacity on public rooftops by 2025. Um, currently there's about 17 megawatts installed and about 46 megawatts in progress. Um, there's also a goal of installing 500 megawatts of energy storage capacity within New York City by 2025, um, although this would be across both public and private land. Um, and this type of clean energy development would have multiple benefits for New Yorkers. Um, it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as other non-greenhouse gas pollutants. Um, and it would improve air quality. Um, and there are also opportunities to utilize community solar, which can provide bill savings for subscribers, as well as non-energy benefits, including um, creating green jobs, as well as educational and vocational training. 
So city owned property does have the potential to be a huge resource for developing clean energy, especially because the city is the largest property owner within New York City. Um, and so all that being said, our research is looking at how city real estate can be utilized most effectively in support of clean energy, particularly storage and community solar. Slide please. Um, so just for a little bit more background information on how city land is currently used for clean energy development, it's currently done with what's called a site access agreement. So a site access agreement acts as a license that allows private developers access to public land and enables the city to enter into a power purchase agreement or a PPA, um, which is basically just a contract to buy solar power. And this enables solar development on city owned rooftops. Um, this type of agreement is slightly riskier for developers. There's no formal lease ensuring their long-term access to the roofs. Um, however, this does not require a formal land use review and it's a quicker development process than the alternative. The alternative approach would be to use a formal lease agreement. Um, this is a more concrete agreement between the city and the developer and the city is locked into providing access to the land for a specified period of time. So this is less risky for developers and potentially a more attractive deal as a result. However, it is more administratively difficult and it does require that extensive land use review process that I mentioned, which can extend an already relatively lengthy development timeline. So through the Power Up research, we will be looking at development options for solar and storage through two primary administrative pathways. The first would be looking in the short term and it's focused on community solar development on public land. So community solar basically allows residents to subscribe to purchase solar power without having to install solar panels on their property. Um, in our research, we'll be looking into the existing administrative structure, that site access agreement pathway that I mentioned, which is currently used by the city to develop rooftop solar and how that process can be extended to um, be, to be a development pathway for community solar. We're also working on a complementary financial analysis that'll measure potential energy bill savings for community solar subscribers, as well as the optimal financing structure that would maximize these savings. Um, and this financial analysis will be taking into consideration existing state level solar incentives, as well as new incentives that have been made available through the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. So digging into some of the results from the financial analysis, the main finding here is that opportunities for greater, sa greater savings have been opened up by the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA. Um, so the IRA has extended what's called the Investment Tax Credit or the ITC, which has been available for solar energy generation, uh, but the IRA has made it available through at least 2032. Um, new incentives have also been added to improve the profitability of projects that serve low and middle income customers. So these incentives are all broken out on the figure to the right. Um, on the top of the standard, on top of the standard ITC, there are now additional tax credits for enrolling low and middle income customers in community solar, siting projects in low income communities, and using materials that have been manufactured in the US. Um, and so these incentives, if optimized and stacked with state level incentives provided by NYSERDA, can cover from about 50 to 80% of project costs, um, depending on the amount of solar capacity installed per project. Um, the IRA also introduced new pathways for solar projects to receive federal tax credits, including direct payments to municipalities that own projects that could open up new doors for New York City, um, and our financial analysis will essentially evaluate these new and pre-existing financing structures and identify which incentives are available across different site locations um, just in order to maximize, um, an avail maximize available revenue streams and make community solar as affordable as possible and also maximize energy bill savings for subscribers. And so the recommendations that come out of this analysis can provide a roadmap for the city for ratepayer advocates and developers to achieve sustainability goals and benefit communities at the same time. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then the rest of the public land research will be focusing on a long-term view. So looking kind of beyond community solar, this will be a long-term view of storage and solar development on city-owned property. 
Um, and the approach that we're looking into would involve bundling multiple properties into a single development project. So this would mean one land use change review for multiple properties. This could speed up the development process significantly and kind of allow more bang for your buck in terms of energy development for a given review process. Um, this would involve the more formal administrative structure I mentioned earlier, the lease agreement, which is not currently used for solo development, um, but ideally could you know, be uh, used going forward for both solar and storage. Um, and this type of development would use the storage siting considerations discussed previously that Kevin mentioned and could open up the opportunity to combine solar and storage, which could help maximize the energy benefits of solar development. Um, so I will pause here. I know I just talked a lot, but I'm happy to take any questions and discuss anything further that anybody is curious about. It doesn't look like there's any new questions in the chat, but feel free to throw a question in the chat or just speak out. There's, okay, there's a question in the chat. Please repeat what has already happened versus what's needed. Um, sorry, Jennifer, I don't know if you can speak up. Could you clarify? Are you asking about what administrative pathways are currently being used versus what options are available? Okay. Um, okay, I'll assume, Jennifer, that your question is kind of about what's already been happening versus what could happen going forward. Basically what's currently happening is the city uses, oh yes, 46 megawatts. No, so um, the goal is to have hundred megawatts of solar established on community, or I'm sorry, on city owned rooftops by 2025. Um, currently 17 are done, but 46 are in progress. Um, and then there's also a study um, of looking at which roofs are considered solar ready in New York. And those kind of provide an option for once those 46 are done, kind of moving on what roofs could be prioritized in the future. Um, another question is how does climate justice play into siting and who gets to participate in community solar? So um, currently we are based on, first of all, just environmental justice concerns. And second of all, um, how IRA benefits work, siting projects in low income communities is Aiming, we're aiming for that to be the priority just because there are more benefits for, for community members and also more tax incentives. Um, there also would be a priority to allow a low or middle income customers subscribe to community solar um, just with priority, just to kind of provide those um, energy bill savings where possible. Yes, thank you. Claudia just posted a link in the chat. So if anybody has any other, is curious about more information on where solar is installed in public land, you can visit that site. Um, and if there are no other questions, which it looks like there aren't, I will pass it off to my colleague, Hayden. So thank you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Hayden. Thank you. Great. And can you see my video? I cannot see your oh, video. Oh, how about now? There we go. We right, thank you. you. It's been a while since I used Zoom. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hayden, and uh, this is the final presentation for the evening here. I will be looking at the potential for actually installing wind turbines here in New York City. 
Uh, so this is a little different from what you might typically think of in terms of wind energy. Uh, the average wind turbine in a wind farm that's being installed right now is absolutely huge, three megawatts, which is enough to power a thousand homes. And you may have also heard about how New York State is pushing to have 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind installed by 2035. Um, so those are big and great and supportive of New York City. But what we're interested here is could we actually install uh, smaller turbines that are uh, 10 or 1,000 times smaller than those large projects uh, actually here in the city on rooftops or along waterfronts uh, so we could generate electricity closer to where it's actually being consumed. Um, and so we're trying to take a large scale assessment of what's the possibility there. We don't want to leave anything out on the table. And while it's an interesting idea, there are, of course, some unique conditions in the urban environment that need to be uh, factored in. Uh, the presence of buildings can reduce wind speeds and introduce turbulence. Uh, it can just be more expensive and challenging to install turbines in such a complex space. And then there are also safety and uh, sound related concerns. And uh, so here we're just taking an initial shot at trying to figure out if we were to fully utilize the resources in the city, how much energy could that provide? Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, but first, I just want to give a, you know, some context to what some past experiences have been. Uh, there are some really interesting and promising examples of wind turbines in urban environments being successful. Uh, there's a fairly large turbine up in Toronto that they installed along Lake Ontario. That's been operating for almost two decades now and has apparently been uh, a pretty good success. Um, however, it should be noted that there are a good number of examples from around the world, from London to Houston, Texas, of turbines uh, in the urban environment that really have not quite met expectations, uh, have not generated uh, as much electricity as was anticipated, haven't operated for as long as had been hoped. Um, and so that, that's useful to just have in mind. Uh, bringing things a little closer to home, uh, there have been uh, at least a half dozen uh, wind turbine projects in New York City over the past decade and a half. Uh, one of some a prominent example was the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They installed a series of one kilowatt turbines on their rooftop back in 2008. Uh, unfortunately, those turbines were not able to access uh, wind speeds that were as high as had been hoped. Um, so those ended up just producing around 2% of the expected generation uh, and they have not been maintained. Uh, there's another project in Long Island City where they installed a series of turbines on the rooftop of a luxury residential building. I don't know how those have actually performed, but we do know that it was pretty expensive to install them uh, using a crane, reinforcing the roof. And so even if they were to perform to expectations, uh, the electricity would be incredibly expensive to the point of not being economical. And then finally, and more encouragingly, uh, there was a uh, commercial scale turbine installed at a recycling facility in Brooklyn along the East River. Uh, it's a 100 kilowatt turbine and uh, that was installed back in 2015. It's uh, operated uh, fairly well. It hasn't fully met expectations, but it is uh, continuing to successfully generate electricity uh, for the recycling facility, providing around 2% of their annual demand. Um, so although it's not yet paid off the initial investment, it is um, a sign of what could be possible. Um, and suggests that maybe this is something looking in, uh, worth looking into at a large scale. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, great, thanks. So just giving a uh, sort of an overview of the uh, procedure we use to arrive at some of our estimates here, uh, trying to do a assessment of a uh, you know, large jurisdiction. Uh, it can be a little tricky just because uh, so much of 
wind projects is really very site specific, uh, but this is something that other jurisdictions have looked at as well. Uh, here's an example of the procedure followed uh, for a study in the Netherlands. And we've generally followed very similar steps in our work as well. Uh, so the first major step was to just collect the best available data we have about uh, the buildings around New York City and try to identify which of those buildings could be candidates based off of general zoning considerations. Uh, and then second, we brought together the best available wind data that we could have, uh, mostly from a federal data resource um, that was provided at uh, a somewhat high resolution around the city, not as detailed as maybe we'd like, but it's um, a good start. And then finally, uh, we brought together specifications from leading wind turbine manufacturers that indicate how different turbines might perform under a variety of wind speeds. And we brought all of this together to look at each of the candidate locations, estimate what would be the distribution of wind speeds at those locations, and uh, figure out how a turbine might perform under those conditions. And then we also did a pretty similar process for uh, ground mounted locations, uh, those would allow for potentially much larger turbine installations uh, along the waterfronts um, in uh, commercial and manufacturing districts, uh, but you need a fair amount of open space within individual lots, uh, so that is a little restrictive in terms of where they could be installed. Uh, we could go to the next slide please. And let's just have one slide of uh, results here, because uh, the, the upshot is, unfortunately, there isn't a huge potential for wind here in New York City. Uh, starting with roof-mounted turbines, uh, there are around a million buildings throughout all of New York City. And out of that wider stock, we identified around 7,500 tall buildings are over 100 feet tall that could be candidates for roof mounted wind. Uh, if all of those locations were fully utilized, um, we installed turbines, uh, the maximum number of turbines we could on each roof, uh, we estimate that they could generate electricity that would match around 0.4% of the current city's annual electricity demand. Uh, and just as a side note, we have a map here uh, showing how the average wind speeds might vary by location and uh, the actual height of the roof where the turbines could be installed. Um, but this does come with a caveat. Uh, we collected some data for a weather station on a, a midtown Manhattan skyscraper, and that suggests that the wind resource is much less reliable and some of the uh, top-down uh, federally provided data would uh, lead us to believe um, the wind speeds on average were much lower at that location uh, than we had calculated from other data. And if we apply that reduction in, in wind resource across all the buildings, it would suggest that uh, we could only provide around a, a tenth of the generation um, that we had uh, previously calculated. Actually, most of those tall buildings would be better off just installing solar panels instead. Uh, and then switching gears to shorter buildings that are located near the waterfront, there are around an additional uh, 1,500 buildings uh, that could be candidates for wind. Uh, but for these shorter buildings, uh, they probably would not be able to access high enough wind speeds to really justify installing a turbine. Uh, so it just wouldn't make sense, uh, our calculations suggest. And then finally, turning to uh, the possibility for larger ground-mounted turbines, we're looking at uh, turbines that are you know, 100 to 200 kilowatts, um, sizable, but not quite a, you know, a full wind farm industrial scale. Uh, we identified some 68 lots uh, around the city that we think could have enough space to accommodate one or more of these larger turbines. Um, and if all these sites were fully utilized, uh, we think that they could provide around 0.1% uh, of the city's annual electricity demand. Um, but 
it seems that uh, probably most of those sites, especially the larger sites, uh, would be better off installing solar uh, just in terms of total energy generated uh, per location. Uh, so again, it, it could make a contribution, but maybe there are other ways to utilize those, those particular sites. Uh, so again, the general conclusion here is that while there may be individual locations, individual buildings where urban wind could be a valuable addition where it could make sense, on the whole, the general potential is limited. And so it seems that at this time, it's not uh, an area that the city should uh, give much priority to in terms of uh, pursuing renewable generation. Um, but it's been uh, interesting looking at this and hopefully this helps to uh, just understand the general landscape of uh, what's possible going forward. Uh, so uh, glad to take any questions now. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Hayden. So there is one comment thus far in the chat, and it is, has there been research into seeing if there are any buildings in New York City that could potentially be converted to a zero energy building? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, I, I assume this means could you install enough solar and wind on a building to um, match the actual energy demand at that location? Uh, I did uh, run some calculations recently uh, about uh, how much of an individual building a turbine, um, or could a turbine match the particular building's uh, generation? Uh, excuse me, let me rephrase that. Could a turbine match the building's electricity demand? I don't think that there were locations where uh, that generation was fully equaling the uh, particular building demand. I don't know if that might be achievable with solar and storage installed. Uh, I think it could probably be uh, somewhat challenging just because of the uh, high energy density of New York City buildings versus the uh, density of renewable generation. Um, but that could be an interesting thing to look at. Uh, but at, at a citywide level, I think that uh, it would be a much more challenging prospect. I hope I answered the question. Hayden, we'll just pause. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Calvin responded. Oh, great, thanks. And we'll see if there are more questions. And certainly feel free to come off mute if you'd like to ask rather than type out your comment. I'm not seeing any additional. So that's the end of our prepared presentations on research. Uh, we were ahead of schedule, so I maybe would like to open it up. I think all three presenters are still online. Oh, we did get a question. Give me one moment. OK. Uh, did you cover local on 97 and RECs? And if the city is supporting a cap on RECs to offset emissions when buildings are seeking to comply with the law? And how is the city supporting the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Jobs Act? Is there a way to encourage slash build geothermal microgrids in neighborhoods? So, Hayden, I don't think either of those questions are addressed. No, to you. yeah, those questions weren't part of our particular scope here. And we also haven't really looked at the economics of installing wind in the city, just because there's so many unknowns there. Uh, probably the majority of the cost would be actually installing it on a building or on the waterfront, and uh, that could get very expensive. Uh, but that would be very hard to try to estimate from a high level. I, I will ask Claudia, though, if she could come off mute and maybe address uh, that two-part question. Sure, and thank you so much for your questions and for sticking with us tonight. Um, so the first question is about Local Law 97 and RECs. Um, so when we talk about RECs 
for local on 97 compliance, the caveat is that they must come from renewable energy generated within New York City specifically. So that was written into the law in order to ensure that uh, buildings aren't paying like a wind farm in Ohio to help meet their compliance because we want to make sure that uh, we're directly reducing pollution from fossil plants in the city. Um, there was local law rulemaking process that released draft rules about a month ago. So I can try and find a link to share in the chat for more information about Local Law 97. Um, when it comes to the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Jobs Act, that was a really exciting step by the state to think about how can we shift uh, gas utilities from instead of being a gas providing service to being a heating providing service by using uh, geothermal. Geothermal um, basically uses geothermal heat pumps that leverage the constant temperature of the ground to provide super efficient heating and cooling for buildings. And when you create district, district systems, um, those can be even more efficient than building level systems because you're leveraging different thermal no loads in different buildings um, all in the same neighborhood. So the city is exploring the potential for this type of technology. Um, we are... Uh, conducting a feasibility study to look at building district geothermal networks to support electrification of city buildings. So that study is underway and will hopefully give us some more information about whether they would be technically feasible on city buildings and that can sort of serve um, as a pilot to better inform opportunities for private buildings as well. And I can put in the chat a link to the city's geothermal feasibility screening tool, which um, provides some uh, high level data for specific city blocks. So you can look up your block to see whether um, at a you know, feasibility screening level, obviously everything has to be site specific. So you'd need a much more information than just the tool can provide, but you can see whether there's preliminary uh, feasibility for geothermal in your area. Hope that answers your question. I think it did, and there's a few more comments that came in. So we'll jump next to Richard Wonder's comment. What about the potential of solar generation canopies on parking lots of malls, big box stores, and supermarkets? Claudia, would you like to take that one or should I? Uh, I'm happy to start. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that we're excited about exploring. It's really rare to find lots of open space in New York City. So when we can take advantage of things like parking lots, that's definitely an exciting opportunity. Um, generally, canopies for solar do cost more than ground mounted solar because you have to have the steel to elevate them. Um, so that's a consideration, but it could be a great way to um, take advantage of that space and also potentially support electric vehicle charging in the parking lot as well. Um, for uh, city lots, that's definitely something that we are looking into and how um, how the city could advance that on parking lots for municipal uh, fleets. And then for um, the private sector, we don't have direct control over that, but we wanna make sure that we're incentivizing solar within the five boroughs to the extent that we can to help us meet some of our ambitious targets. So that includes, for example, advocating for an extension of the property tax abatement to make solar more financeable within New York City or streamlining the permitting process to make it easier for people to build solar in New York City. Um, Zach, feel free to add on to that. No, that was great. I don't have anything to add. Do you mind taking the carbon trading question too? I think that's the last question. Yeah, great question. What about carbon trading for buildings? to do more than enough work to lower their carbon emissions to fall within the emissions limit instead of RECs. Um, so I, uh, I wanna get back to you on that with some links to more information. I am not a buildings expert, but my understanding is that that was considered as part of the local law and there was a study done on what that could look like, carbon trading could look like for New York City. Um, and there were some uh, environmental justice concerns that that could end up meaning that um, if you have, for example, a real estate owner with a portfolio of buildings that they may choose not to invest in upgrades for buildings in 
environmental justice neighborhoods and instead invest elsewhere in their portfolio and that you could end up with sort of pollution hotspots in places where you have low income communities. So I think that's the biggest concern when it comes to carbon trading for buildings. Um, but I also understand that that some folks are focused on, you know, the lowest hanging fruit and doing the uh, types of upgrades that could be the cheapest and, and reducing emissions overall. Um, I think when we're talking about emissions reductions, it's often easy to slip into the sort of citywide net zero, um, which is also important. You know, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the atmosphere doesn't necessarily care if those emissions are coming from the Bronx or from Manhattan, but neighborhoods and communities often do care because those emissions are associated with co-pollutants that can directly impact health. So I think that's the biggest um, concern when it comes to carbon trading, but I don't know whether Local Law 97 rulemaking process had officially made a decision on that. So I can um, try to sh share more information in the chat. Great, and I guess I'll pause once more to see if there are any additional comments. Hopefully we were clear with both our presentations and our responses. And if there aren't additional questions, we can wrap up. I think Claudia is looking for the link so she can send it before we close off. Uh, while, while we wait to close up, I just want to give a quick preview for tomorrow night. So we'll be doing a second session at the same time tomorrow, and we'll be covering three topics as well. Those topics are mostly going to be focused on electrification of both buildings and of our transportation systems. And then a third topic around how those new electrification loads could affect uh, our grid's readiness. So I encourage all to sign up and join us again tomorrow night. Very similar structure and format. And uh, I see a question here. Will there be slides available? Uh, we certainly will share out these slides. And I think, Claudia, you're going to give a quick pitch for the survey as well, correct? Yes, um, so we can definitely send the slides around as a PDF to everybody who registered for this event, and we're also going to be putting them on our website. Um, I can put our website in the chat. It's nyc.gov slash power up. So pretty easy to remember. Um, Zach mentioned our technical session tomorrow, so hope to see you then as well. And then the survey we have open through December 21st, so two weeks from tomorrow. Um, there's some... Uh, ranking questions and then some open answer questions. So really, really looking forward to hearing your feedback and your ideas. The next step is to really translate a lot of these research findings into specific actions that city government is going to commit to taking in the near term to make sure we're on track for our long-term energy transition goals. So if you have specific ideas that you want to uh, make sure we are thinking about, please feel free to put those in the survey responses. Um, we're going to be working on incorporating public feedback and really refining those city commitments over the next few months. And then the goal is to republish the report by next Earth Day 2023. Um, I did not yet put the geothermal link. Geothermal. Sorry, I should have had these like at the ready. But I'm Googling it now and we'll send it to you. It's a Department of Design and Construction geothermal tool. Here it is. Um, and the other link I will put in is the community energy map. I think it's tinyurl.com slash NYC energy map. And that can uh, show you not just the geothermal potential for your block, but also uh, solar potential, other clean energy technologies, and then overlays it with different resiliency and environmental justice metrics. So we can really prioritizing deploying these uh, clean energy resources in neighborhoods where they would have the most community benefits. So that's a fun tool to play around on as well. So I think with that, we can wrap up. Hope to see you at the technical session tomorrow. Hope to see your responses to the survey um, and really appreciate you sticking with us on this Thursday evening. Whoa, not Thursday, Tuesday. What day is it? <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.